Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Rich Underfirth. I am the Director of Engineering for the Metropolitan Sewer District. I'm also the first Vice President of SLC3, and I'll be your MC this morning. As always, we're going to begin with a few housekeeping items. First, please make sure you're muted to eliminate any disruptions during the morning's program. We hope you're also free from distractions as much as you can be. We ask that you keep all questions through the chat function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll address those uh, during the open session. And you can always raise your hand. Uh, we are limited on time this morning. We've got to end the program by around nine. So if you do raise your hand, uh, don't get frustrated. We'll try to get to you uh, uh, at the end if we can. So because this program is recorded, a copy will be available uh, after the program on the website. Uh, Kelly is on vacation this week. Uh, Katie and I will monitor those questions uh, when you raise your hand or, or provide those questions at the end. Uh, please take the time to edit your name, uh, provide your first and last name and, and the company you represent. That'll make it easier for everybody to know where that question's coming from. Uh, as a reminder, SLC3 is a community of design and construction industry professionals with a common interest in the betterment of our region. Our planning committee has identified four key pillars of our organization, innovation, continuing education, equity empowerment, and all-inclusive workforce collaboration. I would also like to acknowledge our training and education chairman, Brandon Minard of the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Brandon leads a committee of 26 volunteers. Thank you to all those members and thank you to Shane Jones with CDG for coordinating uh, Charles, our speaker today. We also seek your evaluation at the conclusion of the program. It's very important to us. We review that at our board meetings. It helps us plan future programming as well as determine all the value of our programming and our networking. Uh, as always, we have a packed calendar coming up. I'm not going to go through those in detail. Uh, Katie's showing those right now. Uh, please go to the website uh, on the upcoming events. And, uh, and I see all the emails, so you get plenty of reminders. Uh, I know summer's busy, but there's some really uh, nice events coming up, particularly one to call out the awards gala in August. Uh, before the program begins, obviously, our sponsors are very important to us uh, and to our training and education program. Our ad, annual plan, platinum sponsor is Cosney Wagner. And I do have to throw a, a little plug in here. I want to see a big project they worked on. They redid our front entrance here at our office at Market in Jefferson. Uh, we have our own green project right in front that includes a green roof. Uh, rain barrels, uh, rain gardens, everything you would need, uh, all part of, uh, of adapting our front entrance for ADA requirements. So it's a really nice project. Uh, top tier support, our gold sponsors are McGrath and Associates, Ross and Barazzini, Kwame Building Group, and Al Keeley. Our silver sponsors are Farnsworth Group, Kaiser Electric, JF Electric, Abn Engineering, OWH Architects, Custom Engineering, and Hush Blackwell. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Now to the scheduled program. Once again, we have the honor of having Jar Charles Gascon as a Regional Economist and Senior Coordinator in Research Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. As a Regional Economist, he analyzes economic conditions in the 8th Federal Reserve District and reports on conditions to the bank president and staff economists prior to the Federal Open Market Committee meetings. He is responsible for writing the bank's page book, report on the econ local economic condition, and contribute to other bank publications. His work has been cited in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and in local media outlets. If that isn't enough, Charles is a member of the American Economic Association, the National Association of Business Economics, he holds a master's degree in economics from State University of New York at Albany and an MBA from our own Washington, Washington University. Uh, Charles, I know I speak for our audience, but this might be <laughs> probably one of the hottest topics uh, going right now. Uh, I think 
I don't go a day without talking about all the projects we have going and how the economy is affecting those. Uh, so we're really anxious to hear what you have to say. So uh, thank you for being here and now I'll turn it over to Charles. Thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, let me just get my slides up from the beginning. Uh, so just to start things off, these are my own views are not necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or the Federal Reserve System. What that means is you can ask me anything you want, uh, and I'll try my best to answer it, but uh, you can't blame my bosses if you're not happy with uh, what I have to say. Um, I'm going to kind of go relatively quick through the first half of this presentation and spend a little bit more time on the economic outlook, as I believe that's probably the part that's most relevant for, uh, for much of our discussion today. Uh, Rich, if anybody puts a question in the chat that you feel like is, is particularly timely to what I'm talking about, feel free to interrupt me and jump in and ask the question. Um, otherwise, we'll definitely have some time for Q&A here at the end. Will do. Um, let me get back to active. There we go. I'm going to minimize this. There we go. Okay, so just to kind of start things off at a really high level, um, and actually before I begin, we'll be able to share my slides. I'll just note um, when you get the PDF copy of the slide deck, if you click on any of these graphs, you should be able to, it'll take you to our website and you'll be able to get a real-time update of any of these charts um, anytime over the next couple of years and into the future. So um, definitely, you know, save a copy down if you want to look at how these, these charts evolve over time. Um, to start things out, uh, I have on this chart right here, uh, U.S. total GDP, so the measure of all goods and services produced in the economy. Um, and then this, this red line in the chart is this measure of potential output, which you can kind of think of as if the economy is fully utilizing all of its resources, you know, what's the potential rate of growth that we can have in the economy? Um, this is a, a theoretical construct and it's estimated. Um, it does evolve over time. There's a good chance that the potential growth rate of our economy right now is actually slower than what this red line is indicating um, due to all the constraints from the pandemic um, and people that have, have left the workforce. Um, but that being said, the point I want to make is that we had the deepest recession that we've had in over 40 years, um, probably going back even further to the Great Depression. Um, but the economy recovered incredibly quickly. Uh, the last recession, it took 10 years to get back up to this trend le level of potential output. Um, and this time we've done it in two years. This is just unprecedented when you think about the magnitude and the depth of this recession um, relative to the prior recessions and how long it took to, to recover. So the economy has bounced back incredibly quickly. Um, one of the main drivers of this, of this bounce back has been the federal support. Um, to households and businesses through you know, the CARES Act as well as the Recovery Act. Um, this was through PPP loans that went to businesses that ultimately showed up in workers' paychecks. And you can see that in the blue line, which shows disposable income, and then the red line taking out the government transfer payments. So we had these huge spikes to, to um, households' incomes um, due to the transfer payments. And not only did that actually raise their, their overall incomes, but it also um, transferred over to, to other workers as, as demand for goods and services remained strong. And we saw um, even earned incomes remain relatively stable and recover quickly from the pandemic and the recession. Um, as that support has waned, we have seen demand start to slow down as household incomes have moved back, um, back towards this, this trend level of, of, of uh, income growth. Um, and again, this is in real terms adjusted for inflation. So you also can see that how elevated levels of inflation have started to erode um, income growth in the last, last couple of quarters um, due to the fact that wages have not been growing as fast as has prices. And just to kind of put this in perspective, you can see relative to the trends from 2014, um, we have slipped below these trend lines in terms of, of real income um, as inflation has eroded away some of those gains. Um, now, that being said, because of these transfer payments and people being stuck at home and, and basically looking for ways to, to spend some of this money to keep themselves happy, um, goods consumption is up through the roof, 16% from pre-pandemic levels. And at this point, even the service side of the economy is, is more or less fully recovered um, and is up about 1% from pre-pandemic levels. So spending is back. Households had all this money and they definitely look for ways to spend it. And even in most recent quarters, um, spending has remained relatively strong. 
Um, part of what's buffering the, the spending, even as, as I showed incomes have eroded, is the fact that savings has been really high. So when you look at the household savings rate, the, the share of income that they've been, they saved during the pandemic periods got up to as high as 35%. So when, when people were getting transfer payments, they were saving 30 cents on the dollar. Um, and they also mainly have that savings buffer built up. So as incomes have slipped in recent quarters, households have started to run down some of the savings. But even today, we still have positive savings rates. Um, so the economy still has significant savings out there to buffer from some of the, the cost increases that we've seen in, in recent months. Um, on the demand side, again, households have a lot of income. Businesses are trying to meet the demand from, from households. And as a result of that, job openings are through the roof. So you've got over 11 million job openings right now with concentrations in healthcare, the service sector, and leisure and hospitality, um, as well as in education as are kind of the key drivers of, of a lot of job openings right now. But they are very wide, broad-based. Um, so this is the highest level of job openings on record. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means for the labor market here in a minute. Um, but overall, what it, you know, what it has meant is that workers have been able to find jobs and, and total employments recovered relatively quickly. So we're only just shy of um, about 800,000 jobs short from the pre-pandemic levels. Um, and again, we got there relatively quickly from job losses of 22 million. Um, at the rate of job gains in the most recent months, We'll probably, you know, if we get another 400,000 jobs as we got in the, in the prior couple of months, we could be back up to full or to um, pre pandemic levels of employment relatively quickly. So the, the labor market's recovered relatively fast and has been in, incredibly robust, but we do expect to see the pace of job gains slow in coming months as we're starting to hit the cap on and what the economy can actually add in, in employment relative to the labor supply. Thinking about labor supply. Um, I have two lines on this chart. Um, I want to note that the blue line is the prime age, so 25 to 54 um, workers, the labor force participation rate. That's on the right axis, and the scale is from 65 to 87, while the red line is total labor force participation, and that's on the left axis here with the scale from 58 to 68. So um, don't be distorted by the, the, the two axes here, but I want to make two key points the first is, as you can see from the red line, demographics have played a huge role in the decline in overall labor force participation since about 2000. And what we've seen is each time we've had a recession in 2001 and 2008, 2009, and then during the pandemic, labor force participation has dropped relatively quickly um, and it never really recovered um, in the last expansion. About 10 years afterwards, we saw some increase in, in labor force participation. Um, but this has been on a downward trend and only some workers have been returning to the labor force. Um, again, demographics playing a key role here. When we look at the prime age part of the labor force, um, participation rates have increased quite dramatically since the pandemic hit um, and are moving their way back up to um, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the report that came out yesterday from the Board of Governors that the chair presented to Congress showed that labor force participation and employment to population ratios for many key demographic groups have moved back up to 2019 levels. Um, so it's broad based with gains across many different income groups, many different demographic groups, men and women have all seen really strong gains um, in most recent months as, as children have gone back to school and the economy is, is wide, widely reopened. But again, due to this demographic factors, there's gonna be constraints to labor supply um, for the foreseeable future. And if you kind of want to put it all into one picture, this is the chart that I've been really highlighting to, to identify how tight the labor market is. And this is the ratio of the number of unemployed workers to job openings. And what it shows you is the number is about 0.5, which means that there's two job openings for every one unemployed person. So even if we were able to fill every one of those 11 million jobs, we would still have to double the number of people that are, that are looking for work. Um, and that, that comes at a cost of trying to get people to re-enter the labor force, either from retirement um, or get people that are off the sidelines due, due to structural issues, either disability or access to transportation, keeping them out of work or childcare and getting them back into work. And if they do so, the jobs are definitely out there at this point with, with job openings uh, at record high levels. 
Supply chain disruptions are continuing every single time. We think that you know things are getting better. Professional forecasters are, are moving out the deadline to when they think these things are going to stop putting uh, upward pressure on inflation. Um, but as I'll show you in the next couple of charts, there are some signs of some signs of easing in, in recent months. Um, so when hey, you Chuck, look, just, I'm yes. going to stop you once real quick because yeah. uh, we do have a question. Do you have any information about salaries? associated with job openings? Yeah, so I'm not gonna be able to get into it. If, if whoever it is, my email address at the beginning, I can send some details. What we have seen is that wage growth for the lower wage workers has been the strongest among all groups. So about 10 to 15% wage group for the lowest 25% of income uh, wage earners. Um, and the wage growth for the kind of the median worker is running around 6% right now, definitely slower than inflation. Um, I can definitely send a resource to some of the details. Um, def def please send me an email with that. Thanks, Kelly. I didn't catch that. Um, so looking at supply chain, I think the main point I want to make is that inventories are all out of whack. Um, manufacturers are reporting higher inventories than, than desired. Um, and at the same time, retailers for a long period of time are reporting lower inventories than what they needed. Um, but there's been a stark reversal in the last couple of months, as you can see these, these figures from the data at least, which are a little bit lagging, um, are, are even showing that reversal is starting to show up. But we're hearing reports, as you all probably have heard from major discount retailers, that they're, they're looking to move inventory. Um, but for the most part, the stories that we're hearing is there's a lot of key components that are just missing, but a lot of other components that are showing up and that have to sit on the sidelines. So it's yet to be seen how this is going to resolve itself, but most forecasters are expecting that it'll be the end of the year before we see any real um, meaningful improvements on the supply chain side of things. Um, every time we think there's something that's improving, there's another key component or product that, that seems to be causing issues. Um, this chart's noisy, um, but it goes back to the 1970s, which is why I really like it, um, just to kind of put a historical perspective behind what manufacturers are seeing. Um, so the two indicators here are delivery lead times and unfilled orders, um, and any number above zero indicates that manufacturers are reporting that their delivery lead times are increasing and that their unfilled order backlog is also increasing. So again, an indication that supply chain disruptions are, are, are key and, and critical. Um, and as you can see during this pandemic period, it's at the highest level of, of, of the entire series going back in time. Um, although there has been some decline in unfilled orders um, in the June data from, from the survey, this last data point that you really kind of have to squint and look at. Um, but again, these are at unprecedented high levels and have a long way to go before we get back to some sense of normalcy. Survey of professional forecasters um, in, in the blue chip um, has been, they've been asking participants when they expect supply chain bottlenecks to um, kind of stop providing such a significant boost to inflation. Um, and what I've done in, from the data is kind of identified what, what professional forecast, forecasters view as a relief date. Um, and as you can see, back in November of 2021, they expected things to be better by July of this year. Um, and then from subsequent surveys, it got pushed back and back and back. Um, and in the May survey, it reached 9.2 uh, months on average, which would have put um, back in February. The June survey did show some improvement consistent with other data sources, um, but we're still looking at the end of the year um, before we... Um, before forecasters are expecting this to, um, to stop providing significant boost to inflation. Um, other analysis throughout the Fed system has identified that probably about half of inflationary pressures that we're seeing today are coming from the supply side of the economy, with about a third coming from the demand side of the economy, and then the others just from miscellaneous factors that are difficult to attribute to one side of supply or demand. So you kind of combine this together and, and here's what you get for a picture on consumer prices um, and producer prices. So producer prices are up 16.4% from a year ago and consumer prices are up 8.5% from a year ago. A lot of what we're hearing from businesses is particularly at the beginning part of the year was that they felt like they had the ability to pass on some of these higher costs to consumers and they've been doing so. Um, and that's also ultimately what led to a significant rise in, in consumer prices. Um, although there does seem to be some softening um, in the sentiment among businesses now, if they can, they can still continue to pass on those, those cost increases to their consumers, um, given this decline in incomes and, and more uncertainty in the overall economy. 
Uh, now this kind of gets to this wage growth part that we we're just touching upon. So I'm gonna just be brief here, but again, wage growth, six and a half percent lower income workers are seeing wage growth stronger than inflation, although median workers are seeing wage growth more around four and a half percent, still below inflation. And that's what's leading to those declines in income that I started my my talk with. Charles, we got a question. Uh, yep. Just kind of on the inflation side, are we looking at additional inflation through the end of the year? You're yes, we are. And I'll be showing that in a forecast here in a minute. All right. Thank you. So just to kind of get an idea of where the inflation rates are coming from, I, I'll, um, you can kind of dive into this table a little bit later and, and look at the numbers yourself. Um, but what I have are the weights, so kind of the CPI basket, how, how households spend their money. About a third of their um, consumption goes to housing and shelter and rent and utilities. Um, and then about 18% is on transportation, which would inc include fuel at this point, but as well as autos, um, the purchase of autos. Um, and then food and beverages is another 14%. Um, one thing to note here is that people don't buy these products every single year. So for example, a car you may buy every three years, every five years, in my case, every 10 years. Um, so while prices may go up, it's not necessarily the case that consumers are gonna feel this at the exact same time. Um, but transportation costs are up about 20% um, from a year ago in May and again, another 20% between May 2021 and 2022. Um, again, a lot of this in the first part was due to auto prices. And then in the second part is coming from the, the fuel piece. Um, food prices have also increased dramatically from last year, 9.7%. Um, while that, those price increases were not there before. Where you see the real major differences are gonna be in places like healthcare, um, which, uh, saw relatively low inflation during 2021, and that that has kicked up um, above the kind of long-term trend levels at 3.7% um, as as people are going back and getting elective surgeries and things like that, and firm and hospitals are facing higher costs and on a lot of their raw materials, and to the extent they're able to pass those on to consumers, it, it, we're seeing that. Um, but again, you go from 4.9% to 8.5% inflation um, in in 2022. The last piece I wanna make is that people are experiencing this inflation very differently. Um, I don't have a ton of time to dive into the numbers here, um, but I'll, I'll focus on the top table. Um, so if you take the lowest 20% of, of earners, a lot of this is demographics. So um, people who are in retirement have less income, um, but they'll be running down their savings which is how, they're, how somebody's able to earn $12,000 and spend $25,000. Um, is, is a rundown in wealth, um, although there are also people who are earning transfer payments. The middle 20% don't save any money, while the upper 20% save about 30% of their income. Um, obviously, prior to this year, you know, saving that money often meant putting it into to stocks and bonds and earning a decent return, which allowed them to offset some of those costs. That's definitely much more difficult this year um, with so much turbulence in financial markets and decline in equity values although home values have appreciated quite substantially and that also provides a, a buffer for wealth. Um, but the point being that inflation is incredibly regressive. So the lowest 20% of households are definitely gonna feel this pain much more significantly than upper income households where they're only spending 8% of their, of their after-tax income on, on food while, or while the lowest 20% are probably giving up about third, a 30 to 40% of their income towards, to, to, towards food price, towards food, um, and those prices are up about 10%. So really eroding people's ability to buy other, other products and services. So that I'm gonna turn to the outlook and kind of put some numbers behind the path forward and, and what it means for the central bank and what you can expect to see. Uh, first and foremost, um, unemployment rates expected to remain historically low. Um, job growth, like I mentioned, is expected to slow, um, although with the labor supply issues that we're seeing, um, it's going to continue to keep the unemployment rate relatively low, um, even with some softening in, in job growth. Um, what I'm showing here on the chart are projections from members of the FOMC, so our, my bosses in Washington, D.C., as well as in St. Louis. And I have three lines on the chart. So the red line is the projections from December of 2020. Uh, the gray dash line is going to be December of 2021, so just about six months ago. And then the blue line is from June that was uh, released just last week. 
Um, I think it's worth noting again what December 2020 looked like when these initial projections were made. This was um, just before the rollout of, of vaccines. Um, we weren't entirely clear exactly how they were going to work, what the effect, effect, effectiveness was going to be, nor the distribution um, and how widespread they were going to be available to, to the population. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the outlook in December of 2020. December of 2021. Um, was again a, a period of time where we felt like the economy was starting to recover um, prior to the global su supply shocks and the lockdowns um, in China, um, as well as the war in Ukraine and Russia. So we've seen the kind of a change um, that I'll note over, over the last couple of months as well. Looking at economic growth, we had 5.5% economic growth in, in 2021. Um, that's about twice to three times the sustainable level of economic growth that the U.S. economy can achieve, given the levels of productivity that we have in population and labor force growth. So that was not going to be sustainable for the long term without um, seeing some inflationary pressures. Um, it was also much faster than what we expected to see in December of 2020. Um, as the economy kind of moved into, into this year, um, the initial projections for growth were around 4%, so again, above trend growth in 2022. Um, since we've seen the notable disruptions um, in global supply chains from the war in Ukraine, um, as well as the now necessary need to tighten um, monetary policy and raise interest rates, um, the expectations for growth for 2022 have moved down markedly from 4% to 1.7%. Um, under the appropriate policy path that I'm going to show you going forward. And again, this is moving again to the long run sustainable growth rates, which are more or less right around 2% long term. Um, participants are also asked about uncertainty and risks around these projections. Um, and as the Fed chair noted yesterday to Congress, there's a lot of uncertainty around the GDP growth forecasts. Uh, much higher than, than normal times, and they're weighted to the downside. So we're trying to engineer a soft landing here where the economy is able to move um, down from growth rates that were not sustainable to something more sustainable, and we're trying to do so in a way that doesn't cause a recession. Um, but there is always a likelihood that, that we run into a recession as, as we try to get inflation under control, which is the first and foremost priority of the Fed at, at this time. Looking at prices, again, um, last year ended about 5.5% year over year on the on inflation. Um, this is the PCE price index, which is the Fed's preferred measure. Um, it does a better job accounting for kind of how households change their consumption patterns as prices change um, over long term. It matches very closely with the with the CPI. Um, Expectations were that um, even at the beginning of this year or at the end of last year, that inflation would, would move from 5.5% down to 2.6% um, in 2022. Um, we're already at 6.3% by this price measure. Um, and the June projections were that inflation by the end of this year would, would be at about 5.2%. So some slowing in prices, um, but we're only starting to see initial signs of some softening. Um, but again, 5.2% is well above the Fed's target, which is for this measure, would be 2% inflation over the longer period of time. So we need to move relatively quickly to get um, its inflation under control. Um, and under the path that we have right now, expectations are that we'll still be above 2% by the end of 2023. So we're looking at about a two to three year period of time with elevated inflation before we ultimately get back down to what we see as price stability of a 2% inflation target. Um, this is markedly different than the inflation path that was projected back in December of 2020, where um, it was expected that prices would increase relatively slowly um, as the economy would struggle to recover from the, from the pandemic. Risks, unfortunately, are weighted to the upside um, and highly uncertain. Um, and this is where it becomes very difficult on a monetary policy perspective because we've got growth risks weighted to the downside and inflation risk weighted to the upside. Labor markets are really strong and the Fed has a dual mandate to maintain price stability and, and full employment or maximum employment. Um, and at this point, we, we believe that the only way to achieve maximum employment in the long term is to achieve price stability. And that's first and foremost the, um, the, at the top of minds of policymakers, um, which is what do we have to do to get prices under control um, and broad-based inflation to come down to the levels that we believe to be sustainable. Um, and there's a few real risks, I think, that we've highlighted that are 
um, the, the why inflation is risk to the upside. Um, one is that expectations have moved upward. So if you look at this picture here, I've got a handful of different sur surveys in the first chart from the Atlanta Fed, the New York Fed, and the University of Michigan, um, showing that short-term inflation expectations for one year ahead are for consumers um, are running between five and six and a half percent, or five and a half and six. Six and a half percent. Um, and businesses are expecting consumer price inflation to be around three and a half percent. So these are much higher than the inflation target. Um, and then when you look three to five years ahead, again, um, inflation expectations are elevated and well above the the two percent level. Um, and this is one of the concerns that inflation could be more persistent than what policymakers um, be, view to be optimal. Um, and that if, if consumers and businesses are expecting inflation to remain elevated, that starts to play a role in workers' bargaining power and expectations for what they should see for wage growth and how businesses will ultimately set their prices. Um, and so we wanna get these things back down to 2% over the longer term so that people perceive price stability to be, to be the first and foremost target. So um, this is a, a clear upside risk to inflation. Then housing is another place that um, is pre presenting a, a major challenge to inflation. Um, I want to note here that um, on this chart, I have um, housing prices in the blue line, um, also um, on the left axis, um, and it's lagged 12 months. So it's showing you price growth um, relative to a year ago. And then on top of that is the consumer price housing inflation. And the reason I'm showing both lines is that housing prices themselves are not necessarily a measure of inflation as there's an asset component built into housing and a wealth component built into housing, just like uh, stock prices. So what we really wanna be looking at for housing price inflation is rents, for example, and then how, for example, homeowners insurance would increase because the price, the replacement value of your home would increase. Um, and in higher interest rates and the interest payments on, on homes um, would also be another component of, of, of housing price inflation. And as you can see, this tracks prices relatively uh, closely over time. And we've seen a pre-market uptick in housing price inflation in the last couple of, uh, last couple of quarters at 5.5% from a year ago. Um, and this is again, tracking housing prices relatively closely um, with, that, with that lag that I noted. So what does this mean for monetary policy? Well, um, as of uh, last week, when policy makers released their projections, um, they noted that the appropriate, um, policy, the appropriate policy rate by the end of this year would be 3.4%. Um, currently, we're, we're just a little bit above 1%. Um, so we're expecting a, a handful more 75 basis point in rate increases um, through the end of this year to get up to 3.4%, which um, policymakers view is just, a, uh, uh, just enough to slightly uh, contain um, uh, the rate of growth in, in something that we believe to be more sustainable. The neutral rate um, for the interest rates at this point in time are around two and a half percent. So anything above two and a half percent, we would expect to have um, the ability to start to slow growth and, and pull inflation uh, back down. Um, with again, a little bit of tightening in 2023, um, moving back up to something that's more sustainable around 3.4%. Um, again, this chart only goes back to 2008, but from a historical standpoint, as, as many of you know, these are not necessarily um, very high interest rates, um, but rather something that we view as, as relatively normal for, for a period of economic expansion. Um, and they've moved up quite notably from December of 2021, as I mentioned, due to the oil price shock that we've seen from, the, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, as well as the push on the commodity prices as well from, from similar shocks. And again, this is more or less consistent with market expectations, um, which have also moved up pretty substantially since, um, since December. Um, and markets are expecting that rates also will be up around just shy of 4% um, by the middle of next year. Um, and again, this also would translate into medium or shorter term treasury rates, as well as mortgage rates uh, moving up um, notably in, in the coming months as, as Fed policy continues to tighten. Just to wrap up, and then we can move to some Q&A here. Um, something went off on my uh, animation. Uh, overall activity, I'd say 
appears to be picking up after declining in the first quarter. So GDP growth in the first quarter was negative. Uh, a lot of that was attributed to trade uh, as well as inventories, which are both very volatile components of growth. Um, but consumer spending remains strong as households have savings and business investments still remains relatively stable. Um, from a historical standpoint, short-term financial conditions remain historically accommodative. So while interest rates have risen um, and mortgage rates have moved up to some of the highest levels um, in the last 40 years, um, when you look over the longer term, I mean, these, these interest rates are still um, relatively, relatively accommodative, um, but this volatility that we've seen in financial markets um, has definitely increased um, due to this uncertain outlook, um, recession fears, as well as global instability um, and this reallocation of global supply of, of things like natural gas and oil as the Western uh, world is no longer trading with Russia. Labor markets continue to improve. Job growth is robust. Wage growth is relatively strong. Um, and we are seeing in the last couple of months at least some modest increase in labor supply, um, which, is, which should uh, at least help alleviate some of the labor, um, labor supply issues that we've seen. And firms are reporting it a bit easier to hire um, than they did about a year ago. Um, that being said, inflation's at high 40-year highs. It's expected to remain above 2% for some time. And what this means is that the policy has to um, move relatively quickly to keep inflation expectations um, more anchored, um, as we don't want the central bank to lose its ability to, to fight inflation. And that's first and foremost on, on our minds at this point in time. Um, that being said, um, we can't do anything about the inflation that we're seeing today because monetary policy is intended to influence future economic growth and inflation. Um, and so policymakers have shifted to removing accommodation much quicker and, and sooner than they anticipated just six months ago, um, so that we can get to a point by the end of this year where we're starting to see price, price inflation start to fall um, and get more to a more sustainable level so that we can continue to have a prolonged economic expansion. Um, but again, this is being done with, without risks um, that are pretty substantial um, on, on both sides to prices and, and economic growth. So. Um, this is a, a very uh, challenging time for monetary policy in the economy um, due to the, the higher levels of inflation that we're seeing. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I'll open it up for questions. All right, I'm not seeing any right now. Uh, I'll, I'll ask one though, back on the, on the job where we lost a lot of those jobs. And the people didn't come back to the workforce. I mean, I myself, I'm the end of the baby boomer. Is that something that maybe wasn't anticipated that the, the tail end of that, of those job workers during the pandemic that maybe you thought were coming back have decided, ah, I'm done, you know, at 60 instead of 65? Yeah, so the... What we saw kind of in the middle to the end of last year with equity prices being significantly elevated, home prices being really incredibly elevated relative to a year ago. We saw a lot of retirees looking at their, their portfolios and their financial advisors telling them like, you're good, you're good to go um, and taking retirement and, and firms realizing these people are likely not coming back. That has pivoted in the last six months as Again, equity prices have, have come down, inflation has picked up, and as a result of that, we are seeing retirees flow back into the labor force. Um, and what actually happens for a lot of people is that they'll retire and then they will re-enter. And what we saw happening during the pandemic wasn't necessarily that more people were retiring, but rather the flow of retirees back into the labor force just dropped more or less to zero. Um, and that has picked back up. Um, and we're hearing reports from businesses that are reaching out to people who retired in 2019 and saying, hey, hey what do you think about coming back, maybe only part time um, and, and helping out in your old job? And people are taking those opportunities. So and you're seeing that in the data with um, even, you know, some of the participation rates for for people over over 55 and over 65 starting to tick up just slightly. Um, but that is alleviating some of the pressures. Um, but shortages of childcare, for example, are keeping a lot of people out of the out of the labor force. And, and some of these people are grandparents and they're helping out with with uh, with their grandchildren um, and not necessarily with uh, 
um, taking back in full, formal employment. All right, we do have a couple more. Uh, yeah, there will be copies of the slide. I'm assuming those, these will be, those will be on the uh, SLC3 website. Uh, so we'll get those, or we'll send out an email of where you can get those uh, with the survey. Yeah, I'll send out, I'll just email over the final slide deck I presented today uh, once I get done and everybody can get a copy of it. Yeah, um, yeah commercial construction, 40% inflation, absolutely. I mean, construction is one of the areas that we continue to see record demand in. Um, and those prices are, are continuing to, to show up. I talked to a lot of people in the freight industry um, and what they're seeing in trucking, for example, is, is a slowdown um, in most parts of trucking and transportation, except for flatbed. Um, and they note that that's really the, the key driver is, is commercial and residential construction. Um, and so the demand remains really strong um, as there's a lot of backlog of projects and new housing starts are, have dropped, but number of projects under construction due to these delays remains really high. Um, so I expect that, you know, we're continue, we will probably see prices remain elevated, um, but hopefully the growth will slow down um, in, in coming months. And I think that's an important point to note, which is inflation is the rate of growth in prices, not necessarily the level of prices. So a lot of people think about gasoline and they think, okay, when inflation's high, gasoline prices are high, and then inflation is supposed to slow and gas prices will fall. Um, that's not necessarily accurate as to what inflation is. So for example, in commercial construction, you maybe have seen 40% price inflation over the last couple of years. Um, if inflation goes to zero, the prices will just stop increasing, but that does not necessarily mean they're going to fall. Um, and so I think everybody has to be well aware that the prices that we're seeing today may persist into the future, but just start growing at a, uh, growing at a slower rate. Um, and that's what price stability is. It, it's not necessarily a reversal of prices back to what they were two and a half years ago. It's, it's just the stop. It's the growth rate needs to stop. So then you can understand what prices you're looking at and how to operate. That's, and the growth rate is what you see trying to maintain at a level. Exactly. So we're not trying to get prices to decline. What we're trying to do is get them to stop growing. Um, another question about the young labor force. We did see a lot of reports focusing on increased unemployment benefits. The research that I've seen so far is relatively mixed as to what impact that ultimately had. Um, we did see reports, though, of, you know, because household incomes were relatively high, younger people were not necessarily looking for jobs in the same way that they were before. But we also understand that they had all, many different factors from caring for older siblings or younger siblings that kept some of these younger people out of the workforce. Um, and then online schooling um, was another key challenge for many younger people that kept them um, in, in school and rather than working. Um, so unemployment rates for younger people are always high. They're always the highest uh, am among any demographic group, um, but you know they have come down with this this labor market um, in, in tightening up a bit, and wages ultimately increasing. We still have some time for more questions. This this has been you can ask me anything. Don't feel like it has to be something I covered here in this talk. I'm I'm happy to you can you can shoot from the hip. Yeah, the construction uh, question there with regard to construction materials kind of, if, if you look at what lumber did, you know, the last couple of years, it, it, it spiked, but then it came back to a level and it's kind of sitting there and it never went back to where it was before, but at least it's at a level now where it's going across. Now fluctuates with, I think, supply chain more than anything. So. Yeah, and I would, uh, Rich, just to kind of comment on that, and then I'll get to this other question that, that showed up here. Um, you know, I, I think the key is stability in prices, because when you're trying to write contracts, for example, you just want to be able to lock in your prices and know what you're working with, and then you can make decisions around those prices. That's why stability in prices is so important. Um, regardless of what those numbers actually are, you just need them to stay where they're at so you can move forward with your life and make the optimal decisions given the prices that you're looking at. That's why price stability is ultimately so important. Um, with respect to government programs, um, government stimulus, for example, would, um, for example, cutting taxes or, or, in, or increasing spending or giving checks to offset some of the, um, the higher prices 
unfortunately increases demand further and, and could probably have the opposite effect on inflation, which is to increase those prices further. Um, ultimately, it's the job of the central bank to, to, um, to reduce inflation expectations and keeping those expectations anchored is ultimately the key to keeping prices stable over the longer period of time. Um, it's very difficult to use fiscal policy to, um, to uh, control inflation for that reason, because most of the factors that policymakers want to look to are how do we give people more money to offset their higher costs, and that ultimately has the exact opposite effect on uh, what we think about. Uh, Non-residential construction over the next three to five years. Um, I think as we're facing higher interest rates, um, it's going to make construction more costly, um, particularly on the residential side. On the non-residential side, um, business investment remains relatively stable, um, particularly in, in the industrial space. Um, commercial is still a real big question mark at this point in time as to kind of how that's going to play out. Um, ultimately, I think that we'll have a better idea in the next say six months um, as to kind of what the allocation of jobs is going to look like across metropolitan areas. I ultimately expect to see resident non-residential construction pick up in, in core urban areas and suburban construction start to decline um, because of what we're seeing in the housing market, which is if you build office parks in suburban communities, that takes land away from where we can build houses. And ultimately, people want to live out in those areas, and they don't really care where their offices are located if they're only going in two or three days a week. So I expect to see people facing longer commutes, ultimately jobs moving closer to city centers, um, and, and that would ultimately allow there to be more buildable land for residential um, in, in the in out, outlying areas. I think that's about a 10-year pivot that that's going to happen, but that's my long-term hypothesis on how this is all going to play out. Um, with respect to remote work and where people want to live and where they and where they ultimately work. There's a question in the Q and A that you're not seeing there. Do you track economic data specific to minorities, women, and veteran uh, business enterprises? Yeah, that's a great question. So, with respect to labor market indicators, we do have a lot of data on on how how women, minorities. Um, veterans are identified as well, although the samples tend to be a bit smaller um, and on the labor market side of things. With respect to ownership of businesses, it gets a lot more complicated because there's a lot of businesses that don't necessarily have an owner associated, like a, a demographic associated with them. Um, so my preference is always to look at labor market indicators for, for different demographic groups. I'll use worldwide technology here in St. Louis as a perfect example. They're the largest um, black owned business in the country, um, but the performance of that company doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot about kind of how those different demographics are faring within the St. Louis area, because that company hires a lot of people all over the country of many different demographics. I think we're not to the Steve Cornish. We continue to see increase online uh online retail sales, driving warehouses. Yeah, so I think, you know, I'm on the planning commission here in University City where I live. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're hearing a lot about recently is kind of more flex space. So, um, and that's what the requests have been coming in for. So, you know, taking online large on uh, large retailers and, and kind of splitting their space into um, large format retail as well as warehouse and distribution. Um, and kind of reducing parking requirements so that they can put loading docks in the back. Um, that seems to be, at least anecdotally, what I'm hearing, the, one of the paths forward for many of these uh, retailers, um, which is to have more kind of mixed use space of retail and warehouse combined. Um, and, and so that seems to be the path forward that, that I'm hearing a, a lot about, um, which is ultimately retail being kind of partly warehouse at the same point in time. Um, with forecast for St. Louis wage growth. And yeah, so, so I think wage growth is going to remain relatively strong uh, in the medium term, um, as again labor supply remains constrained. So we're looking probably at similar numbers to the national averages, um, but it could be higher than that, particularly for some of these jobs that can be done remotely, um, for nursing and web development, for example. Just to highlight too, um, what we're seeing is that these jobs that are national markets. 
And companies across the country are ultimately saying, well, I can hire somebody in St. Louis um, for a wage that may be cheaper than what they're seeing in San Francisco, but still much higher than what we're seeing in St. Louis. Um, and so we're seeing wage convergence across the country. Um, and what that means is faster wage growth in low cost metro areas and slower wage growth in some of the higher cost metro areas. So I expect to see significant convergence in wages across the country um, over, over the coming decades um, as, as people start to realize that just because a place has a lower cost of living doesn't mean that a worker is willing to take a lower wage to take that job. Just like if I was to move from my current house to a house that costs half the amount, I wouldn't expect my employer to cut my paycheck. That's just not the way the world works. Um, and that's something that St. Louis businesses in particular are going to have to really start to think long and hard about is that they can't use the low cost of living in this region as a way to attract workers at lower wages. Home price appreciation, I expect to continue, although I do expect price growth to slow as interest rates are coming up. If there's any softening in the market, it's particularly going to be at the high end of the market where you start to lose buyers, um, but otherwise buyers kind of shift their way down the house price spectrum. Um, so that is expected to kind of remain um, pretty strong house price appreciation throughout the, throughout the region. And again, similar convergence um, across the country in that area. Um, I have debt to US debt levels to GDP. So debt to GDP has definitely increased notably um, due to the pandemic. Um, uh, it's at relatively, uh, I would say relative to other countries around the world, it's slightly elevated, but in a, in a place that I would view to be sustainable. Um, that's come down in the last last two or three quarters um, and because growth has been much stronger than we expected it to be. So GDP has increased quite noticeably. Um, and then again, household incomes are up and we expect to see debt to GDP ratios come down in the, in the kind of the next six to, six to 12 months um, due to the, the numbers that we've seen. Um, and so I, I do expect to see some stabilization in those debt to GDP ratios um, and debt financing has, has been historically low on a lot of the longer term treasury yields um, have been less than 1%. So with inflation, that actually also puts uh, the federal, federal government in a position where they're actually seeing their debt burden ultimately slow down a little bit because they're able to pay it off with cheaper money. I think we got time for one more. You got one more down there and then we'll turn it back over. Commercial real estate with virtualization of the workforce. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would like to point out that probably about 60% of the jobs in the economy are just, we're not able to currently do them remotely um, for one reason or another. Um, I, I, I hear this question a lot and I think there's almost a, a, a bias given, especially when these virtual presentations where many of us are virtual, there are a lot of jobs we can do virtually, um, but there are a lot that still need to be done in person. Um, and that's gonna continue to remain, keep the demand for a lot of these, um, these office spaces um, there. The other part of it is that the research that's coming out has been showing, particularly for younger workers and new labor force entrants, there's a huge value add to productivity of in-person work and learning. And so we've seen this movement over the last 50 years, I would say, of saying, okay, globalization's happening. It's easier to trade globally. You know, this should kind of dissolve the need to have cities and everything can be done remotely. But we've seen the exact opposite happen. Our largest cities in the world have grown astronomically. Rural areas have declined. Um, so, you know, while I think you can make a case and a narrative that maybe this is different, that's the case that's been made for the last 50, 75 years as new technology has advanced. And what we've seen is our largest cities just continue to get bigger and bigger. Um, and there continues to be benefits to agglomeration. And so my default is to say that that's going to continue. And we're going to actually see, again, our, our cities continue to start to grow as the pandemic subsides and um, households and businesses start to see the value of being close to one another and learning from one another. All right, I'm gonna, I am gonna throw one more at you. It's on the Q&A. Is onshoring of production such as pharmaceuticals possible given the labor market situation you presented? I think that it's something that we're actively hearing a lot of 
businesses looking into, particularly as they try to understand what the costs are of these disruptions. Um, there's two options that I see playing out. One is that businesses decide to hold higher inventories. The other is that they move production closer um, and, and allow it to be more sustainable. That's the trade-off that needs to be made. It's gonna be a question of how, how costly those inventories are to hold. In the case of pharmaceuticals, obviously what the shelf life of, of those products are, if they view the products that they can sit on the shelf for a longer period of time and the relatively low cost inventories to hold, then they'll probably continue to make them overseas where labor costs are, are lower. However, if the costs of those inventories are really high and they need them to be lean, then those higher labor costs would probably allow them to move that person nearby so that they can avoid some of those disruptions in the long term. So I think it's going to be a business by business decision, um, but there is definitely a desire at this point to, to realize these shocks to the economy um, have really you know, hampered this idea that we have just-in-time production and, and keeping inventories low. So it's going to depend on the product and the cost of holding inventory as to if it moves onshore or if it remains overseas. All right. I think that gets them all. Charles, I think if we were in person, you'd be getting a standing ovation right now because you're very informative. Uh, no, we appreciate you being here. So uh, at that point, I'm going to, Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yep, I'm going to make this real quick. Chuck, I know you have a nine o'clock, so you can hop off, but you know we appreciate you. Uh, yes, you are quite informative, and yes, we will share this. Of course, online, we'll get that to everybody, and you just shoot it over to me, and then I'll, yep. I'll make sure I'll it send it done. over to you in, a, in a, about an hour, Kelly. Thank you very much. Okay, that's and awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, get going. <laughs> Uh, as far as everybody else, appreciate you being here. Just want to remind you to please take that survey. It'll be coming to you shortly. We do appreciate your, your uh, feedback and we try to improve our programs each and every time. So it's really quite important to us. If you have any questions for us or anything, just know that we will get this information out to you. Uh, and of course, those events are coming up. Again, the gala, August 23rd. We would love to see your support on that and uh, have a great rest of the week. Enjoy the weekend. Stay cool. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.